Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Tony Alamo? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, then I'll move to my analysis. Bernie Lazar Hoffman was born in Joplin, Missouri on September 20, 1934. Later, he changed his name to Tony Alamo, so I will refer to him as Tony. Even though Alamo would be the pronunciation that comes to mind first, Alamo is the pronunciation he used, based on his desire to appear Italian. Tony moved to California when he was a teenager. He tried to make it as a singer and claimed to be a music promoter. He would later claim that the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, and the Doors requested his services. They wanted him to manage their bands. Tony met a woman named Edith Opal Horn in 1964. They became romantically involved. She was nine years older than Tony and had already been married and divorced twice. She moved to California to work as an actress, but ended up as a con artist. She would visit churches along with her daughter and tell fictional stories about how they were missionaries. The churches would give them money because they were impressed by the story. Tony was arrested and convicted of a weapons charge. He served three months in jail. Tony and Edith married on August 19, 1966. It was at this point the couple legally changed their names to Tony Alamo and Susan Alamo. Tony made it seem as though Susan was his first wife, but later reports would surface suggesting that he had been married four times before Susan. There's no way to know for sure. At some point, Tony and Susan had a radical conversion to Christianity. According to Tony, Jesus came to him during a meeting at a Beverly Hills investment firm and told him he wanted him to preach about the second coming. Jesus told him that if he didn't, he would kill him. In 1969, Tony and Susan founded the Alamo Christian Foundation. It would have a few different names throughout the years. They recruited members into the church by walking the streets of Hollywood, California, telling people that if they would come to a church meeting about an hour away, they would receive a meal. The belief systems of Tony's church involved a heavily distorted version of Pentecostal theology. Tony was militant and paranoid, he promoted a number of conspiracy theories. He was anti-Catholic, claiming that the Vatican controlled the media, the United Nations, and the White House. Tony believed that UFOs signaled the end times and carried messengers from heaven. Tony started several businesses, which were staffed by the church members. These followers were encouraged to work for very little money or for free. They had to take a vow of poverty and give their money to the church. I guess Tony and Susan had taken a vow of wealth, so it all worked out from their perspective. Having followers work for free is a classic sign of a cult. The disparity between the church members and the church leaders was profound. Some of the members had to scavenge for food in dumpsters as Tony and Susan accumulated millions of dollars. Tony moved his operation to an area near Alma, Arkansas in 1975. Just as he had done in California, he opened up several businesses. At one point, he owned as many as 29 businesses, including a grocery store, a trucking company, a landscaping business, a candy company, an auto repair shop, a construction company, a nursery, a hog farm, a restaurant, a store that sold Western apparel, and several gas stations. The church members worked for non-monetary benefits, and some of them eventually complained to the authorities. In 1976, Tony was charged by the Department of Labor for violating the Fair Labor Standards Act. The case dragged on for many years, but Tony eventually lost. Later, the tax-exempt status for his church was retroactively revoked for the years 1977 to 1980. Tony continued to fight the government, claiming that his businesses were really churches in disguise. Therefore, they were exempt from federal income tax. He was not successful. Throughout the late 70s and early 80s, Susan had a number of health problems, including breast cancer. She told the church members that God would save her. He would keep her alive. 
she was absolutely positive that under no circumstances would she die. On April 8, 1982, Susan Alamo died. She was 56 years old. After her death, Tony predicted that she would be resurrected from the dead. He put her body on display in a room. There were church members in that room at all times, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, praying for Susan to be resurrected. Tony screamed at them when she did not come back to life, accusing them of having impure thoughts and not praying hard enough. After six months resurrection-free, he moved her body to a heart-shaped mausoleum. This reminds me of those signs that businesses have that say something like, 25 days without a lost time accident. This church needed a sign that said, 180 days without a resurrection. Susan was a moderating force in Tony's life. After her death, his behavior became even worse. Tony had a number of relationships after his wife died. In 1984, he married a Swedish woman. That only lasted two years. She complained that Tony wanted her to have plastic surgery to look like Susan. Tony married two more times over the next four years. By 1994, he may have been married several more times. It's a little unclear, as he would later plead the Fifth Amendment when asked about this. It's believed that the number was somewhere between 7 and 24 spiritual wives, as he called them. Apparently, he had multiple wives at the same time, and there were some issues with the ages, as in they were too young. In February of 1991, federal agents raided the church compound because Tony was a little bit behind on his taxes, about $7.9 million behind. Before they could get there, Tony ordered the members to leave and take Susan's body with them. After a lawsuit by her daughter, Tony returned Susan's body in 1998, and she was buried in Oklahoma. In June of 1994, Tony was convicted of filing a false income tax return and three counts of failing to file a tax return. He had earned $9 million during three years when his church paid no taxes, and he owed former church members $5 million for work they performed for his businesses. Tony went bankrupt, and all of his businesses failed. He was sentenced to six years in federal prison, but in 1998, he was released after just four years. Tony started a new church called Tony Alamo Christian Ministries. It had about 100 members. It was in Miller County, Arkansas, and had branches in Sebastian County, Arkansas, and Los Angeles, California. Tony's church produced a radio show where he would deliver a message about how the government was doing the work of Satan. In 2007, Tony's church was labeled a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center due to its anti-Catholic position. His compound in Miller County was raided by the authorities in 2008. Tony was suspected of transporting underage females across state lines for the purposes of sex. His crimes occurred from 1994 to 2005. He was convicted in July of 2009 and sentenced to 175 years in prison. Tony Alama would die of complications from a urinary tract infection on May 2, 2017. He was 82 years old. Now moving to my analysis. Here are a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. The belief system of Tony's church was that the King James Version of the Bible, and only that version, was the Word of God and the authority on matters of faith. However, Tony also claimed to receive special messages from God. If somebody disobeyed him, they were really disobeying God. The church members had to believe everything that he believed in order to get to heaven. They had to believe the Catholic Church was trying to take over the world, the Pope was the Antichrist, the government was out to get Tony, and he was really innocent, and Tony's church was the only true church in the world. Every other church was corrupt. Item number two, Tony emphasized that everybody in the world was going to hell, except for members of his church who followed his rules. Every time church members did something he didn't appreciate, like criticize him, they were going to hell. I guess this made life simple as far as Tony judging people, like somebody would come to him and say, I doubted your wisdom, world pastor Tony, which is what he sometimes called himself. He would say, well, you're going to hell. Another person confesses that they stole some money, better prepare for hell. And somebody else says, I left the thermostat set too high. Well, I hope you enjoy the heat because you're going to hell. It just seems like such a lazy way 
to conceptualize punishment. Tony would talk about hell in great detail with the fire and the torment and terrify his followers. The children would have nightmares about burning in hell forever. There was nothing complex about Tony's manipulation. There was no charm or charisma. It was all just fear. Item number three, Tony encouraged the church members to spy on each other and report infractions to him. I find this interesting because Tony said that Jesus was always watching and would tell him people's thoughts. Yet Tony still needed to have little spies throughout his compound. One member talked about how Tony would instruct the church members to say a particular phrase to themselves when they had impure thoughts. The phrase was, the blood of Jesus is against you, Satan. The problem here is that if one church member was saying this phrase under their breath and another member heard them, they could report the person for having impure thoughts. Tony was encouraging people to be obsessive about impure thoughts and then punishing them for using his remedy to solve the problem. Item number four, according to church members, Tony was vindictive, punitive, and violent. No violations of his rules were tolerated. Tony controlled every aspect of the lives of the church members, what the children were taught in school, who would get married, who was permitted to eat, who would receive clothing. When people were caught for having impure thoughts, doubting his authority, or breaking any rule, he would have other members beat the devil out of them. Children were frequently among the targets. He would tell the members that the pain of the beating was better than hell. I find it interesting that all these members would strike each other in order to get the devil out when the devil was right there in the room telling them to attack each other. Item number five, even though one could argue that it was reasonably clear Tony was running a cult, a number of people would purchase products from his businesses. One of the most notable examples is that Western apparel business. Tony would have church members, including children, sew denim jackets and cover them with rhinestones. These jackets became a favorite among celebrities, including Elvis Presley, Don King, Miley Cyrus, Brooke Shields, Sonny Bono, Hulk Hogan, and Michael Jackson. Tony could not have afforded to produce the jackets without illegal labor. With all this in mind, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. I think that Tony became overzealous about his belief system, and this connected with some of Susan's values. So they kind of put their ideas together to come up with what they considered a cohesive belief system. The couple didn't start the ministry with the intent of being fraudulent, but soon started committing financial crimes, like tax evasion and not paying employees. When Susan died, there was no one to regulate Tony's behavior. Here we have a person who could convince his followers to do anything he wanted. He could not resist using that power to satisfy inappropriate and illegal desires. Over time, his behavior became increasingly dangerous until the justice system put an end to it. Some cult leaders realize that they are con artists, but others do not. I think that Tony came to believe that he was really hearing messages from God. His narcissism expanded to a delusional level. When he first claimed that Jesus appeared to him and threatened him with death, Tony spent a lot of time going from church to church trying to find clarity on his encounter. I think he may really have believed he was selected by Jesus to save the world. Tony may have been psychotic. This explains a number of his unusual beliefs, like UFO messengers, the one world government, and the idea that he ran the only legitimate church in the world. It's difficult to know who is more dangerous, the cult leader who knows he is lying or the cult leader who is delusional. The case of Tony Alamo reminds people that there's an easy way to remove all the risk. Avoid any type of cult leader. Those are my thoughts on the case of Tony Alamo. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as a resurrection-free workplace. Thanks for watching.